Hello, 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 everyone. I know it's been a few minutes. Whoo, it's been an interesting few weeks now, hasn't it? Um, anyways, I'm not wearing a love shirt today. I am wearing, look what I found. Look what I found. The light in me loves the light in you. Isn't that perfect? That's still perfect for me, right? So anyways, if it's not a love shirt, I always try and, I buy a lot of shirts that try and convey a message of frequency. So it really sets my day when I put on a shirt that says love, or I put on a shirt that says something about following your dreams, or I put on a shirt, something like this, you know what I mean? And it brings a smile to a lot of people's faces. Um, you know, everybody's just so in this a lot of people, like all of you that are watching my stuff, you guys understand about raising your frequency. You understand about holding the vibration. A lot of people aren't there yet though, but they they feel a difference in energies. And so when, they, when you set your whole tone with the frequency, um, it's a lot like when you get up in the morning. I started changing the way I got up in the morning a few months ago. I used to get up in the morning and the first thing that would come to your mind, especially as a mother or a single mom or a single parent, right? Or just somebody who has a lot of responsibility. The first thing you think of is all the crap you have to do that day, right? And all the bills that you haven't paid yet and all these like things. I quit doing that. The first thing I do now when I wake up is I tell myself one statement right away. I'm gonna have an amazing day, a beautiful, wonderful, fabulous day. It's gonna be great. Everything's gonna, I'm gonna follow the synchronicities. I'm gonna follow my intuition. I'm gonna follow my higher self. I'm not gonna let my ego guide me. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna flow harmoniously. And ever since I've been doing that, I'm gonna trust the universe, you know, to provide what I need at those moments. Ever since I've been doing that, things have gotten so much better. You know what I mean? So I would just advise you to try that. But then I put on a shirt that really sends the message of, of what I want to encompass that day. And like I said, something, you know, I know a guy, a lot of guys aren't going to want to walk around wearing a shirt that says love all over it. But you know what I mean? It's just one of those things. We all have to find those small, small little ways that we can utilize that raises our vibration that works for us and whatever that is for you. So you know me, I love my shirts. So that's the one I'm wearing today. Um, I did want to start by sharing a story um, or a testimonial, I should say, that is so awesome and just goes right into that follow the synchronicities, right? So um, I believe it was last Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday night, that I was, I haven't really been pushing my Ormus. Um, I got some new supplies and the yields on these last three batches, I had three orders in just recently and so, um, the new supplies and the new yields I got were phenomenal. The best that's I've ever I've ever produced actually, um, as far as yields go. Yields are tough with Ormus. I mean, sometimes you get a tiny little bit after you've worked a really long time on it, and sometimes you know, like these last this last batch was just like phenomenal. But I just was like, maybe it's not the right thing to do. And here's why: not because of my experience. My experience has been phenomenal with it. But when I first got led to Ormus was at the very beginning of my awakening and my very, my physical body, it was right after my NDE, it was right after my surgeries, um, got very, very, very sick. I was so sick physically in so many, in so many ways. Um, I had really horrific purging happening from my body, stuff that was coming out of it looked like it was right out of a sci-fi horror movie, no joke, like no joke. And I have documented that, I just haven't released it to the public because it's yucky and nobody wants to see, nobody wants to see that stuff. And it's not gonna help anybody to show that stuff at the moment. Um, it's just not, that's not the vibration I really wanna put out there. But my point was I got led to that during the time that my kidneys were starting to shut down, my doctors were very worried about keeping me out of the hospital. And then, you know, my higher self led me to Ormus. But I tried, once I started using it, and I didn't have enough money to buy it, so I had to figure out how to make it. That's how it worked for me. I was too broke to actually be able to spend a bunch of money on it. But once I started using it and I saw these fantastic benefits, like my whole health just went, I've never been so healthy. I've never been so healthy. My connection with my higher self got better or God or whatever you want to say. Like everything, more empathy. It just, everything was so amazing. It was just truly a blessing to me. But I tried to tell my parents, I tried to tell my guy, I tried to tell my kids, I tried every, please everybody take this, I, I'm giving it to them, I'm making it for them, I'm giving it to them. 
I can't tell you like how many bottles I handed out to the people that I love and still sitting there. Not one effing person has even tried it. I'm not kidding. My dude didn't try it. My parents didn't try it. I even put it on my parents' plants months in advance and said, look, if it doesn't kill your plants, give it a fucking shot, right? What do you have to lose? Nobody would try it. My kids wouldn't try it. And, they, and everybody just not only wouldn't try it, but they were just triggered. They were triggered by me even mentioning it. They were triggered by me um, talking about it. They were triggered by everything about it. Sorry, hold that thought. My cat's scratching at the door. Hold on. Really? You gotta wait till I start talking? Come on. I tried to get her to come in five minutes ago and she wouldn't come in. Okay. Anyways, but yeah, like I couldn't, like, and not only were they triggered by it, but they made me feel kind of like an ass. For, for even bringing it up. Like, they were like, you're going to hurt people pretty much. Like, my parents were, when I said I was starting to sell it, you should have seen the look my parents gave me. Like, oh my God, what are you thinking? This is a terrible idea. And I'm like, but you haven't even tried it. So how would you? It's just dead sea salt and distilled water and some, you know, some baking soda without the aluminum. How can that possibly... Now, if you get the pH wrong, let me just be very, very clear. If you mess up on the pH with Ormus, it can be toxic. But I'm very careful, and I do measure my pH. Um, but that is something that some of the videos that if you are trying to make your own, if you find online, some of the videos don't talk about the pH level. And you do need to be aware that there is a certain pH. Ormus only comes together at a certain pH, and it's not a huge uh, like there's a very specific um, uh, pH level you have to kind of hit for it to come together. And then also if you go too high, that can be toxic, you know, so you just have to be very careful. But I always am very careful in the measuring that I do with my uh, pH levels. But just know that if you are making your own, there is a pH level you do need to hit. Um, a, for it to be effective, and, and B, you don't want to go too high because that can be toxic. But yeah, nobody in my world would even try it. And every time I brought it up, it angered them. They all acted like I was a lunatic. Even after taking it on and off for a year, and they could see, I mean, my parents who have known me my entire life, who have known I've always been sickly, they could see this massive difference. And they would concede it. They would concede that my lupus episode, you know, my lupus symptoms were gone. My lifelong horrific allergies were gone. I wasn't getting sick. Like everybody else in my house could get sick. I wasn't getting sick. My dog is messing with my cat over there and she's slapping the crap out of him right now. So I'm sorry, I'm trying not to laugh. Um, but yeah, they, they would concede that, but they wouldn't give it any credence or that it had anything to do with the Ormus. And they still just acted like I was a nut job. So it wasn't until I'd sold a few that they were like, oh, you're making money? There has to be validity in that. And I'm like, that's not where I hold validity, but you know, if that's what works for you, you know, meet people <laughs> where they can be met. But I got the most ama amazing confirmation because on the, you know, last week I started to go, maybe I shouldn't be selling this. I'd started not to push it. I was thinking maybe I should retract it and say, I'm not going to sell it anymore. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Because the, the few people I had sold it to, I hadn't really kept in touch with them. I didn't know what their res their results were, uh, if any. And I just, you know, my whole point with my channel, I never wanted to come forward. I never wanted necessarily to be in this position. I never, you know, had dreams of becoming a YouTube star, be you know, becoming famous. Not that I'm famous, but you know what I mean? I just... I never wanted to be in the public eye, I guess is my point. Uh, the only reason I did come forward was, like I said, because I'd heard about a 22-year-old kid who had killed himself. And I thought if, if there's information that I have, you know, I'm nobody's teacher. And I, you know, I'm not, I don't, I just want to share my experience and, and hope that that helps somebody, you know, like I said. So if there's information I'm sitting on that could help somebody, it's wrong of me not to share it. And with the, with the Ormus thing, I just felt the same way. I saw so many people in the same position that I was, that they were trying to balance their physical bodies, but they were really sick. And I knew it had helped me, and so it felt wrong not to share that with other people. But I started to wonder if I was doing the right thing. And so I was like, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Less than 24 hours later, it was one of the last thoughts I had before I went to bed. And I was kind of sad when I went to bed about it. I was like, maybe I should pull it, you know. Less than 24 hours later, the next morning, I woke up to a series of messages from the very first person who actually purchased an order from me. And I have asked him if it's okay that I share um, 
I share his testimonial. I'm not going to share his name uh, because that seems like an invasion of privacy a little bit. I didn't ask him about sharing his name, but he did say I could share his, his testimonial because uh, he wrote back to me. Yeah, like I said, I woke up to those messages the very next morning. And so I'm just going to share with you what he wrote. And uh, we'll just call him WH. That's what we'll call him. And he said, hey T, I wanted to get the link for ordering as I am ready to place another order this month. I have felt good and actually just got back labs from my doctors that have shown significant signs of change in positive ways. Now I will share just a tiny bit of his backstory. I'm not going to go too far into it. It's not my story to tell, but he was very, very ill. And he had already had one heart surgery when he was very young. And the last time I had talked to him, he was looking at possibly having to have another one. He was very, very sick. And so he said, um, as an example, I had a result of a 98 alt in my liver enzymes, which were leading the doctors to do a biopsy. But my last two tests of over the last couple months have dropped to normal ranges of 20s to 30s from 98. That is huge. I mean, that is huge, you guys. This is truly a blessing. If you'd like to start a new batch, I'm ready to place an order. Thank you and much love. And then, of course, I was just, like, shocked because I just asked my higher self. I had just said to the universe and God and whatever, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to, you know, waste anybody's time or waste anybody's money. And then to to wake up to that. And then he said something else when we got, I of course, we I immediately messaged him. And we started going back and forth. And, you know, he said, you know, I wanted to tell you sooner, but I wanted to wait uh, I just felt like it wasn't the right time and I really wanted to wait to get a certain set of labs back so I could give you a specific a test result. And like I said, how perfect was that timing though? How perfect was the synchronicity? I had just asked the night before to my higher self, like maybe, you know, yeah. And then boom, it was like the perfect timing. So as we can see, once again, nothing is chance. Everything is so perfectly orchestrated, right? Beautiful. But I did want to share with you, um, I have three, yeah, three new batches uh, that I'm just saying. Finding out, but I wanted to share with you, yeah, kind of what they look like. So, you know, I'm trying to see, I'm so bad with spatial perception. So, you know, if you don't know what Ormus looks like, those are the bottles. That's the big, one of the big jars that I, I send out. Um, that's like one of the smaller jars. And that's again, one of the bigger jars. Sorry, I'm really bad with spatial perception, obviously. Now I did want to show you, I ordered these tiny little spoons, which are super cute, but, well, geez Louise, really. Um, they're even a little too small. Like, I, you can't really tell when you order them how, how big they are, but they're, they're teeny tiny. So, um, yeah, you might need a couple of spoonfuls. Anyways, I include directions with how much you should take and instructions and all that when I send it, when I send it out. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you guys. So I am going to continue to make Ormus. I do think it's important, especially after I got such, whoa, where are we? amazing confirmation. Sorry about that amazing confirmation that this is really really working well for people like I knew it worked in a, incredibly well for me and like I said I really just wanted other people to have a beautiful incredible experience with that as well especially as we are trying to activate our DNA and some of us have had you know 40 years and 50 years or 30 years of putting crap into our bodies or uh, taking pharmaceutical meds because the doctors prescribe them for us or buying into the the bull crap narrative that we are sick and so you know it's such a beautiful way to, to balance your body I don't think you should become dependent on it I don't take it every day now in the beginning I did take it every day just to balance my body but now I don't um, the last thing I'm just gonna say about Ormus real quick is that we um, I lost my train of thought due to shipping I do have to raise the price just a little bit I didn't really count that in originally but the shipping is like really taking out all of my profit almost well not all of it but close to um, and so I'm probably gonna have to raise the price by like 10 bucks per bottle but here's the great part like I said uh, I am including more in each bottle and those bottles even the small bottle 
that will last you for months. So it's you're, you're not going to have to reorder all the time. And, and this is something that you can try for several, several months. The big bottles, that last you a year probably. I mean, the first time I made a big bottle for me lasted me a year. I mean, so you should be good to go with that. It just depends on how much you take. And, and that's going to be, you need to trust your body with that. So that's that's my Ormus spiel. So probably the big bottles I'm gonna have to raise, you know, like I said, both 10 bucks. So a little bottle will probably cost you about 40, we'll say 44 bucks and the big bottle will cost you, well, it was like 50 or 55. I don't wanna say 66, that sounds really weird. So we're not, we'll not go with that, <laughs> but probably like 60 bucks. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Moving on, so much to talk about. There's just so much to talk about. I'm probably gonna divide this video into a couple different segments. Um, the first thing I do wanna talk about is somebody had asked me to go over my NDE and my story. So I'm probably just gonna start with that. So let's just, just because a lot of people are just finding my channel and so, uh, you know, and when I put out my first vlog, which told my story, I was at the very, very, very beginning of my awakening. I didn't know a whole lot about any of this. I didn't really, I had a small glimmer at what was happening, but I definitely have so much more information now and I've had a much longer time to go back and kind of scrutinize my life and everything that's led up to this. So let's just dive right into that. Before we get into my NDE though, I'm gonna explain, somebody asked me about what's led up to all of this. I remember being five. I remember being very small. And two things happened that I, I have like imprinted Kodak moment. I call them Kodak moment memories where the imprint is so strong, like you can smell the memory, right? It's just so vivid. And one of them is when I was five, I realized I was different from other kids because I remember being on the playground and I had a bunch of candy and I was handing it out and there was a little boy who wanted it so badly, but he was completely silent and he was you know, not one of the more popular kids, uh, but I could feel his desire. I could feel his feelings. I could feel his thoughts. Um, I am empathic. I didn't know that's what it was at that point. I didn't know the word for it until I was in my mid thirties, I don't think. And so, but because I could feel his desire, I of course made sure he got quite more than I think anybody else. Cause I could also feel his sadness. Um, Cause I, I, I don't know, I just could feel his, his being. So the next day, somebody else was handing out candy and I didn't say it works. I thought they will feel my thoughts and they'll, they'll know and they'll do what I did yesterday. And they didn't. And it was the first big like aha moment for me that I'm not like everybody else. I might be a little different, you know? Um, Cause I remember saying, well, why didn't you, why didn't you know? And they looked at me like I was crazy. They said, you didn't say anything. And I was like, but you should have still known. I knew. And they all just looked at me like I had a third head, you know? And so that was my first moment that I was like, oh, maybe I'm not like everybody else. But I have this distinct memory of being five and being in my bedroom one night. And I don't know what I had seen that day that traumatized me so hugely, but probably a war movie. I think it was my dad was military. And so he thought I was a boy, I think, until I was 14 and made me watch every war movie that has ever been created, ever. The very first VHS movie that he ever brought home was Conan the Barbarian, and I think I was seven. So let me just put it, th <laughs> let me just put it that way. Um, but yeah, every military war movie that's ever been made, uh, I've probably seen. He thought, uh, yeah, like I said, he just, he tried to make me a Marine, and I think at 14 he realized it wasn't gonna happen. But I remember I'd seen something so terrible that disturbed me so greatly. I remember being five years old and getting out of my bed and feeling the need to stand in the center of my room where the light, um, the moonlight from the window was hitting me. And I remember, and I didn't do that. I had never done that, but I just felt this pull that I needed to be standing. Yeah. In the middle of my room, in the middle of the night, um, you know, with this moonlight just pounding in on me. I think I was holding my pound puppy. Do you guys remember pound puppies? I'm really dating myself, <laughs> oh my God, right? Um, and I remember just sobbing. I was sobbing hysterically and it's so vivid. And I remember calling out to God, whoever. I knew that, there, there, I just always knew there was other stuff. I didn't know what exactly it was, but I knew there was other stuff and I knew there was a God and I just knew there was a different way. I just knew there was, and I didn't understand 
why things were the way that they were here. I didn't understand the hurting each other. I didn't understand the violence. I didn't understand any of that. It made me so sad and so upset. And I remember just having these tears just running down my face and being just almost hysterical and just saying, I can't do this alone. You have to send more. You have to send reinforcements is the word I kept using at five years old. You have to send reinforcements. You have to send more people. I can't do this alone. You can't possibly expect me to be to do this alone. This is so much worse than I thought it was. How many of you had a very similar experience? I'm betting most of you. I'm betting all of you almost. You know, if we really look back, I'm betting almost all of you when you were little probably did something very similar. And it's so funny because I've always remembered that, but it never really clicked until my awakening. And then I went, oh my God, right? Oh my God. But I remember just staring at the stars and just saying, I can't do this alone. This is too messed up. This is way too messed up. It's way too dark, way too much evil, way too much just bad stuff going on. I need a lot more help. Please don't leave me down here alone. Please send other people, <laughs> right? It's really funny how that works out. And there is just a few other things in my life that looking back, you go, oh my gosh, it all makes sense. There was uh, another time uh, right before my NDE. It was actually a couple years uh, before my NDE. And I was really, 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 really sick. I was detoxing off of pain meds, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I had had lupus and they had put me on a bunch of opiates and I did not like the way uh, they made me feel. And so I had chosen to go off of them. And so I was detoxing at home and I was so sick. Oh my gosh, I was so sick, I was so sick. Probably the worst I've ever felt in my life, honestly. Um, anyways, but I remember I wasn't asleep. I was in this in-between phase. I wasn't, I wasn't asleep. I was, you know, but I wasn't really probably completely lucid either, you know. Um, and I had this, you could call it a vision, I guess. Um, being empathic, I didn't ever consider myself psychic, so I was never prone to visions. I never really heard stuff, you know. Um, but I had this vision of me, and this is going to sound kooky, so I apologize. Um, and I was never huge on organized religion, so um, don't take this the wrong way. But I had this vision of me walking with Jesus, like no kidding. Like he was wearing this like white kind of robe thing, uh, sandals or barefoot, I can't remember. But we were in the desert and we were walking through, I don't know how to describe this. It was kind of, it looked like a maze almost, but it was like this path, but the walls were just completely high with sand, but it was like hardened sand and these weird shaped walls. And we were holding hands and just walking through this kind of tunneled pathway um, in the desert desert made up out of these, like I said, really high walls of sand. And he was holding my hand, which I thought was, I remember thinking at the time, well, this is weird. Jesus, like, where'd you, like, what the, where'd you come from? What are we doing here? Um, and I remember being shocked in my, like, vision as I looked down and saw we were, like, holding hands, but it just felt so normal and natural to me, like he was my best friend or my dad or, you know, just somebody so close, you know, it was just a very strange feeling for me, because, like I said, I wasn't big on organized religion. I always believed in a God, and I always had believed in uh, Jesus, so to speak, um, but I just, it didn't, yeah, I didn't do well with organized Christianity, let me put it that way. I got kicked out all the time in uh, Sunday school, all the time, because I asked questions or I said things that they didn't like. I didn't believe in a wrathful, vengeful God. I just didn't. I said, you're full of crap. That's not how it works. It's not how it works. And they didn't like that. So I got out in the hall, Taylor, all the time. Um, but he said to me, get ready. It's almost, it's almost time. And this very specific statement, he said, you will be one of the first to change. You know what you're supposed to do and you will help the others. And I, I didn't know what that meant. Cause I want to say this was like 2008, 2009. Um, and I had no idea what any of that meant. You know, I just no, no clue, no clue at all. And so whatever, fast forward, you know, uh, a few years and it was late 2015 and I'd started to, maybe I'd started to wake up in a weird way. I mean, I think my son's autism really woke me up. I think everybody falls down an original rabbit hole. So I think my first rabbit hole was the vaccine controversy with my son's autism because my son was definitely uh, vaccine, I don't know that I like the word damaged, but changed from that day, not okay. And so um, my thought process was he was okay, 
something happened that day, the day we he got his last batch of vaccines, which I didn't want to do because I had a feeling I'd put it off and they weren't supposed to do them that day um, because he was sick on top of it. But the doctor pretty much forced me into it. Uh, no joke. He actually said to me, uh, I guarantee you, Tony, he will not become autistic. And I guarantee you there is no mercury in vaccines anymore, which after the fact, I got his lot and batch numbers and traced them and proved to him that there was mercury in his shots, how much was in there, and he was shocked and appalled and actually quit practicing for a, a large number of years. He just actually started practicing again, but he will not vaccinate uh, any clients or any patients at this point. He actually won't even hold his own practice at this point. He just practices uh, through other practices at this point. I think my son's case freaked him out so bad. He was a good man. He had three sons of his own. I don't think he would have ever done that had he had any idea. I think he felt completely betrayed uh, by the government and, you know, by his colleagues, you know, that were hiding this information. You know, he believed the government. They said that they'd taken mercury out of the vaccines. What he didn't understand is that they didn't, they weren't mandated to take it out. They were requested and they didn't. They, they lowered it to trace amounts in some, but the flu vaccine currently still has the highest amount of mercury we've ever seen in the vaccine. So, so much for that. They did take it out of dog vaccines, supposedly, though, in like 1991 in uh, eye lens or eye contact solution. Anyways, uh, but yeah, I think the first rabbit hole I fell down that started to make me give me a glimpse into getting off the 3D track was vaccines. I started to get a real terrible look at the underbelly, uh, the controlling system, the matrix, you could say, uh, once that started. And so right about late 2015, um, I started to look around at the chemtrail issue. You know, I started to go, what's going on with this? I started to just notice things, you know, uh, in, in very interesting ways. And I'm very honest with you guys, so I'm just going to be honest about this. I had a lot of very strange medical issues that popped up out of nowhere. Um, I'd had a copper IUD, had had it for eight years, and um, all of a sudden it perforated my uterus, uh, and I got very, very sick because they wouldn't listen to me, and it took them two weeks uh, to get me in. Unbelievable, unbelievable, right? Because I guarantee you, no offense, dudes, if it was a man thing and you guys would handle that immediately, I'm telling you, uh, the way women's health care works is a joke. It is a complete joke, and I know every woman is completely nodding with me right now because it's some bullshit. You got a metal freaking instrument that has now perforated part of your body. You don't wait two weeks to get someone in. So anyways, by the time they finally did get me in to confirm that that had actually happened, I had a raging infection, uh, which was probably some of the worst pain I'd ever had at that point. Uh, and that was including two problematic pregnancies. So uh, at any rate, uh, there went my birth control because obviously I didn't want to do that again. And because I don't know if it's because I'm RH negative or what, but I just never did well with uh, hormones. So I couldn't utilize the pill. I couldn't utilize any of the other crap because they all had hormones. Every single other option has hormones. Except for condoms. And we all know how much everybody loves those. <laughs> all right. So anyways, fast forward a little bit after that, I ended up getting pregnant uh, unexpectedly. I mean, really, I'd already had uh, ovarian cysts. Uh, I didn't think there was any way possible I could get pregnant at that point. Uh, it's in my 40s. You know, my dude, God bless him, but he likes to smoke quite a bit of uh, cannabis, and so I thought there was no way his swimmers would even be able to get out of going in the freaking circle. That there is no way they could find it. <laughs> there no way anywhere. Just saying. Oh my goodness. Um, but yeah, apparently one of them found found the found the home plate. So uh, I ended up getting pregnant, and um, I had a really tough time with my two my 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 two sons just getting them there here. I um, went into preterm labor with both of them, and the doctor had actually encouraged me to get my tubes tied after my second son because I had such a terrible pregnancy with him. I had three amnios, um, and he was five weeks early. Well, both were five weeks early, but I mean, I barely barely got him here. I had seventy seven plus days of contractions because I went into preterm labor so early with him. It was really really terrible. I was on bed rest for I want to say like five to six months out of that pregnancy and I was incredibly sick but this time when I got pregnant it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced I knew immediately something was very very wrong my body started attacking that baby immediately 
it was probably one of the most painful experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, looking back, I know this was all part of this giant orchestrated process though. You know, it just was part of how these things need to work. And you know, nothing is coincidence, nothing is chance. This is all such an orchestrated, every single thing seems perfectly divinely placed. Does that make sense? Um, but what happened was I was forced to do a medical termination because my body had instantly started attacking the baby. And so it was a possible life-threatening situation, not only for the baby, but for me. And so we planned uh, a day for the medical termination. I'm not gonna get emotional. I get emotional at everything, but I, I, I don't generally get emotional about the subject. So I don't know why I am right now. Hard to talk about to complete strangers, I guess, and just put it out there publicly. Um, but, uh, ooh, um, but yeah, so the day that we were supposed to do the medical termination, um, it went wrong. It just, I don't know. He, the guy who was doing it, uh, had not experienced anything like it before either. It just got so painful. I literally, I am a tough cookie, like when it comes to pain. I'm, I handle pain well, or at least I used to. I don't know about now. Uh, once you start that crystalline DNA, everything gets changed around. And so I don't know that my pain sensors are the same now, but I'd always been able before able to handle pain very well. This, I ended up screaming, like screaming on the table so loud. And my guy was with me, obviously. Uh, he actually made the doctor stop, you know, and the guy's like, well, I'm almost done. And the guy, and my guy's like, you're killing her. Like, I, no, like, like we couldn't, I could just, I couldn't bear, I literally, my body couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear it. And so he said, well, I was almost done. You'll be fine. I'm going to send you home and your body will just take care of the rest. It'll be fine. And no, it, no, it wasn't, it wasn't fine. It wasn't fine at all. I, I laid there at home for six days, basically hemorrhaging to death. Um, I call, I kept calling, you know, like something's, I, I'd never been, between all of us, I had never been in so much pain in my entire life. Like I, it was the most painful experience. Um, I was hemorrhaging. I was hemorrhaging to death at home. The cramping was horrific. Um, and I just felt like I'm going to die. Like this is, I'm going to die. I knew, I knew it felt like that there was a choice. It really felt like to me and my whole world kind of was upside down anyways at that moment. My guy was really kind of a mess to be perfectly honest. Um, he had kind of been staying with me. It was just, it was a real mess at that point. Uh, let me put it that way. I think sometimes when you find, I don't know exactly if he's my twin, but we're definitely uh, soulmates to a certain degree. We've had other lives together. And I think sometimes when you find somebody that you have a, a, a huge contract with, that it's not all easy, it's not all like, you know, rainbows and sunshines. I think you're mirrors for each other. And so when you find somebody, and especially somebody who's been through so much trauma, he's been through such immense trauma, um, you know, he never thought that he deserved love, you know? Uh, and so when I came along, that's who I am. I am love. That's, that's, who, I, that's who I am. That's who I've always been. Uh, and unconditional love in a way that most people, Sorry, that light's uh, kind of bothering me. And uh, most people don't trust at first. It's it's almost my love is almost as as pure as an animal, so to speak. Uh, you know, because I just I truly love unconditionally. I don't know another way to do that. I think that's something to do with being empathic. You know, um, and so he just didn't trust it. He didn't know what the f to do with that. And so he fought it and uh, was really terrible, to be perfectly honest, uh, during that time period, uh, especially. And so things were really, really difficult at home. And so as I laid there and just kind of languished, and I knew instinctively and intuitively, uh, this is an exit point for me if, if I want it to be. This, this could be an exit point. Like I could check out if I want to right now. Um, and I knew that if I didn't make a call uh, to go in uh, to the emergency room, at, there was one night it kind of all came down to it. And I remember talking to the baby, I guess, um, at one point. And I remember saying, that's, that's hard. I've not shared this with anybody. I really, <laughs> it's hard. Um, and I remember saying, I don't know if what I did, or this was maybe right before that, but it was during this time period. And I said, you know, I don't know if what I'm doing is the right thing. I don't know if this was the right thing to do. I don't, what if I messed up? What if, you know, but I didn't really have a choice, you know, um, 
and I remember I heard this voice. It's one of the only, there's only been about three or four times in my life where I heard a voice like, uh, most of the time when I get messages and stuff, I just know what they're saying. It's like a telepathic communication. I actually heard a voice and I actually could like, it was like in front of me, like, in, like it, it was almost like it came down and it was like, like right there in front of me. It was like somebody was standing there and I actually heard it uh, verbally out loud. And it was, it was a girl's voice and she said, I was never supposed to stay. It was never the deal. I was never supposed to stay. I was, I was, I came to help you. I, ca I came to help you. You need, you needed to wake up. And I didn't understand what that meant then because I didn't know anything about awakening. I didn't know anything about anything about that at that point. Um, and she said, you've got a lot of stuff to do. And so that was the night I made the choice, you know, I had to very clearly make a choice. Either I cannot make the call right now and I cannot wake up tomorrow or I can make the call and decide to live. And so I did. I decided I wanted to live. And not only did I want to live, but I wanted to live and do what I'd always done. I wanted to live and to love other people. I wanted to live to help other people, be in service to others. I wanted to make a difference uh, somehow, you know. And um, so I told my, my guy the very next, you know, uh, well, when he got home from work that night, I said, you know, I really, I'm going to die here if I go to sleep tonight. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow. I know I won't. I've lost too much blood. I'm losing too much blood. It was actually just increasing my blood loss. I said, I really need to go to the emergency room. And he said, well, call your doctor first and see what he says. And I did. And that guy, if I listened to that guy, I'd be dead right now. Because he's like, you'll be fine. I'm just calling some more uh, pain, painkillers for you. You'll be fine. And I was like, I I'm not fine. I knew intuitively this was, you know, a make it or break it moment for me. And for me to say I want to go to the emergency room, everybody knows me, who knows me, knows I will not go unless I'm, like, it's like life or death, pretty much, because, yeah, I just don't, yeah, I don't appreciate doctors. Uh, being RH negative, they've never really gotten it right. They always give me this weird look like, well, that's a strange set of symptoms. We don't know what to do with that. Hmm. So anyways, I went into the emergency room, and the doctor said, yeah, had you gone to sleep tonight, you, you would have hemorrhaged to death. Like, that would, yeah, we would have been done. And how dare, how could that, anyways, they, they basically said the other doctor had totally messed up. It was a complete nightmare. They had to go in and, and basically, you know, do what they call a DNC. Um, it was just a mess. It was a real mess. And then I ended up also having to have a third surgery. Uh, so I had three procedures basically within two months. And the third surgery was what I kind of call my, my, I call the whole experience my NDE, to be perfectly honest. A lot of people have what they call an NDE, and it's this flash, and you have the tunnel, and it's just like a car accident. There's this one moment. For me, it was this like two-month period of being just, I'm sorry, Leo! this two month period of just being in incredibly sick and, and going through this process. And so I also had to have my tubes removed. Um, about a month later, they made me wait four weeks for my insurance company because uh, the doctor wanted to do it that night, but they wouldn't let her because uh, of my insurance company. So I had to go back in four weeks. And so basically I had three procedures done, you know, uh, or, or two surgeries or three surgeries done in, in a very short amount of time. And my body was just like, that's it, I'm done. So the last surgery that I had, uh, four weeks later, actually on the way there, I said to my guy, I said, I have a really terrible feeling about this. I don't feel good about this surgery. I feel like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna wake up. Like, I, I feel like there's some, this is iffy. And uh, when I woke up from that surgery, I couldn't focus my eyes to read. And I started to notice that I could just see more layers and details and things. It started with the colors, like the colors were brighter. Um, I could look at anything, a wall or, I mean, anything, my dog, especially living things, so especially people or animals, and I could just see, I didn't know what it was then, now I know it's light language, um, but at the time I had no idea what it was. It was basically like looking at hieroglyphics, like w embedded within everything. So like, let's say I'm looking at the wall right here, you know, it looked like the wall, but it, I could see this extra layer that looked like hieroglyphics that were made up out of, because it was like columns and columns, but they were all interwoven and interconnected like this giant collage. Um, and it looked like they were made up out of mathematical equations, 
tons of different languages and I'm talking like languages that I didn't even know were languages until I started looking up some old ancient languages like Phoenician and you know um, Aramaic was one of them um, but languages that had just mostly symbols and stuff um, I also saw you know numbers and some images and sacred geometry but it was all like interwoven and interconnected in the weirdest way and it looked kind of like hieroglyphics is how I would um, describe that but a lot of geometric stuff and I just didn't understand what any of that meant at that moment I was so confused it was like I just woke up different you know I just woke up knowing more things I woke up with an awareness that I just I didn't have before and that's when things started to get really weird that's when I started to have these very strange physical you know changes happening that's when I started to notice you know um, things getting really really crazy that's when I started to be led to awakening stuff I think one of the very first things I was led to was uh, the West Penray uh, papers and if anybody's not familiar with him he actually just restarted a YouTube channel um, him and his girl uh, Ariel Glad I believe you guys got to check out his stuff he's amazing I adore him um, West Penry W-E-S-P-E-N-R-E -E. and his research and papers are phenomenal uh, so I definitely recommend him so he's one of the very first things I was led to and then one of the other things I was led to immediately was Nassim Harim I don't know if I said that right please forgive forgive me if I messed it up but his um, I want to say his presentation on uh, fractal was it fractal universe and I think it's I'm not sure if I'm gonna say this right the fiber I'm not gonna say it right so I'm not inattentive but anyways a lot of sacred geometry stuff and 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 his work his research um, which was so far over my head and I had no idea why these things were popping up into my radar I didn't I didn't have any understanding of any of this stuff I've been interested in some weird stuff my whole life but the things that were coming into my awareness now were just I mean it was crazy uh, Greg Braden was another thing I was led to and his research in the light body um, skinularity and you know uh, just this really crazy stuff that I'm just like I don't know what any of this means what does any of this have to do with me like I don't I don't get it and then I started to receive these really weird messages like I said I started to have strange things happening uh, supernaturally around me like my t my phone would just open on its own across the room and I wasn't touching it Pandora wasn't even on my phone and it would just start playing a song uh, that I'd never even heard or it play a song that I had heard but yeah I wasn't touching it I didn't put it on and they were the strangest songs like uh, I want to say the two first songs that ever happened like that for me and, and now there are people who talk about, I want to say, is it unbiased on the fence? Uh, he's interviewed a guy a few times and he calls uh, the Pandora music playing, calls it Sam, I want to say. Uh, but they talk about how that's how he gets his messages. But the two first songs that I heard was, uh, I think the very first one was The Script. Um, and it was Hall of Fame. And if nobody's heard that song, you should check that out. And it's like, you can be the greatest, you can be the best. Um, it's all about, you know, you can be basically anything you can be, you want to be, but just, you know, your name's going to go down in the Hall of Fame. And then ironically, uh, very shortly after that, the song Centuries by Fall Out Boy uh, played on its own. And then um, Thomas Rhett uh, played uh, Star of the Show, which is like basically like being in the Truman Show, you know, all eyes are on you, no matter where you go. And so it was just really weird. I started to have you know web pages open on my phone to things that just were the, it was like the perfect information that I needed at that time you know that would come to me um, in just the strangest ways and like I said I would just wake up and something would be playing or it would just even my TV like clips of movies would come on in just the perfect perfect places at the perfect times um, or like I have a a video on my Google Plus page I want to say I've talked about it in a couple of other my videos where my TV froze in this very strange picture and repixelated uh, we tried unplugging everything we tried you know and it just kept coming back to the same picture so on my Google Plus page I, I have this very strange uh, you know this picture of this very strange image that looks like two beings uh, sorry Leo's here Leo's here no Leo we're talking about oh god now I can say just Sorry, everybody. Nobody's here. Leo is talking about you. Anyways, but, um, you know, uh, they looked like two beings that were not human with their arms outstretched holding what looked like bowls. It almost looked like they had snorkels for heads or something. I don't know. It's very interesting. Um, but they both were carrying what looked like these ginormous bowls uh, in their arms. 
I don't know. I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. But I just started being led to all of this weird, this weird information. Like, I didn't know anything about light bodies. I didn't know anything about, you know, DNA activation. I didn't know anything about Morgellons. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about awakening. I I didn't know anything about any of this stuff, you know? I didn't know anything about RH stuff, you know? I didn't know anything about the 144,000 or the Rainbow Warriors. I didn't know anything about anything. And it was just like the information started coming in so so fast and so hard and so rapidly. It was just like bam, 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 bam. And every day was just like more of this unraveling, you know? Um, it's like, you know, like putting a puzzle together. It's like each day I would get more pieces to the puzzle, so to speak. And it was just a really interesting time. Um, but the more I, the more, how do I put this? I do feel like in the beginning when you start your awakening, you almost do get attacked. Um, I think the more you become aware, it's almost like this bell goes off and, and you could say lower vibrational entities, you know, really tried to, I don't think it's going to be the same now. I think that we've reached such a precipice uh, and the energy wave is, is so, this giant tsunami and there's so many that have gone before now that I think it's, you know, um, not going to be as hard for the people waking up now as it was then. But I think, you know, in the beginning when you would wake up, it's really like, you know, you were targeted almost by, you could say, lower vibrational entities or I don't know, uh, whatnot, you know, other stuff. And they really didn't want you to wake up. And so, you know, they really tried to, to either make you self-harm or go insane. I really do think that that's a large part of, of the process, or at least it used to be. I hope it's not anymore for people. Um, but, you know, you all, uh, every, almost everybody goes through that, these veils. It's not just one veil. There's many, many vari veils. And one of the veils is you have to come through this process where you have to get to the point where you realize it's a choice and that it's your choice. And that you can go through this process in a really icky way, or you can go through this process in a really good way. But it's your choice, and you have to choose. And you also have to choose to go through the confusion and, and be confident in what it is that is happening. Does that make sense? Um, because at the beginning, I thought, you know, I was plugging into the reality that this was transhumanism. This is coming from chemtrails. Uh, that I was being turned into, yeah, this transhumanistic monster and, and everybody was going to die and this was a terrible, horrible thing and God help us all. And it wasn't until I changed my perception. And for me, a big part of that was when um, I found Escocaris, uh, E-S-C-A-R-C-H-A-S, or also known as God's Glitter, because the things that I had started to see come out of my physical body, that was the first time that I saw anything that was exactly like what I was seeing that wasn't related to Morgellons, and it wasn't like gonna kill me. It was actually something that was supposed to be beautiful and from God and from, you know, and that had been documented, that had been happening to people since, you know, we, as far back as we have records. Not only people, but religious items that, you know, uh, had been worshiped. And then uh, there was pictures, and the pictures that they showed of these, you know, uh, the, these same things that I show, geometric fractals and, um, these gold pieces and all this it looks like confetti almost but everything that they showed in some of these pictures that are some of them are hanging in monasteries you know these these pieces of escocaris or god's glitter uh, it was exactly what i was seeing and so for me it was the first time that i could actually go oh my god this could be this is maybe maybe this is a really good thing you know maybe this is okay and and so for me there was a big turn right there and then one of the other messages I got, you know, shortly after that, I'd always had the message that I was protected in some weird way. That was always just known for me. I don't really know why, but I just always knew that. And looking back on my life, there's so many times that it was obvious that something had, sorry, I just saw this blue, this giant blue flash of light, like right out of the corner of my eye when I said that. Um, but there were certain times looking back in my life that I, you just, I knew I was protected, that something had intervened on my behalf. Um, and so there was a, I remember there was a specific morning that I was, I was told 144,000, you need to, you need to understand what the 144,000 is. I don't want to say that I was told I was one of the 144,000 because that sounds very egocentric. And I think we all have a hundred, the hundred, I think there's a, 
the way I look at it is, is we all have the 144,000 DNA light codes within us. I think we all have access to that. I do think, however, only so many are activating them at this time. Whether that's only 144,000 people, I, I don't know. I think that number seems low to me at this point. Um, I don't know the exacts on all of that. But I was told very specifically uh, through one of my weird messages. I get these. I got these weird messages all the time. Um, I kept getting these messages that kept saying, "You are one of the point zero. It was so specific. I remember the first time I got this message. I just went, "What?" And it was one of those ones where my phone just opened up on its own to, um, I think it was a video, a YouTube video or something, and, and it was some weird channel I've never heard of before, uh, and it just started playing on its own while I was making dinner one night. And I remember thinking. I remember saying out loud in the kitchen, like, you got to be kidding me, right? Like, you, right? Like, you're, you're joking, right? Like, that's so specific. There's, there's, like, really? Can we get more specific? But they kept saying, you are part of the 0.00987% of humanity that is, is of a higher consciousness level right now. And you are so important. Like, you don't understand how important you are. And I remember just thinking at that time, because I didn't know anything at that time, really. And I remember thinking, you are full of crap. What are you talking about? I don't know what any of that means. You're tripping. Life sucks. You know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever, right? It was pretty early on, and so I just didn't understand what it any. I didn't understand what it meant. Um, and then I remember just getting flooded with, with 144,000. You need to understand what the 144,000 is. You need to understand what the Rainbow Warriors are. That kept coming up a lot. I think that was right about the time, too, I got led to Magenta Pixie. And I think uh, she had just put out a video about the 144,000, which was ironic and synchronistic. Um, and then I think either right before that or right after that, she also talked about the Rainbow Warriors because I didn't know that the natives had, had any prophecy about that. I didn't, was so not on my radar, you know. And I got led to Moldavite, like right at the same time. Um, it was just a lot of interesting synchronicities that all just kind of started popping up. And I started seeing the, the number 144 everywhere. Everywhere I went, I saw 144, 144, 144. Just thought, wow, I don't know any, I don't. I mean, if I wrote it all down, it would just sound insane. It would sound so crazy. But during this process, I started to see that my physical process was just you know, off the chain, it was increasing, but I couldn't find anybody else showing it. Like I, except for, like I said, the only, the only things that I could find related to my process was the filaments, uh, that Morgellons people were showing, but every Morgellons forum was horror. It was terror. It was pain and suffering and, and sadness and overwhelm, you know, it was just not good. And so I just felt like that wasn't the right place. Does that make sense? Uh, and then I started to really see these, you know, yeah, these geometric fractals, which were starting to be so beautiful, um, you know. But like I said, it, once I changed my perspective, once, uh, for me, the day I claimed my sovereignty was the, the day that things really changed in a beautiful way, uh, and things got a lot, lot easier for me. Let me put it that way. Um, for a long time, like I said, I felt like I was maybe targeted, like there was somebody like I had a handler so to speak I actually had a name for him I called him earmuffs for the people who don't like profanity I called him fucked hard asshole or, no I'm sorry it's fucked hard ass nut I actually like would talk to him every day and I'm like I don't know if you drew the short straw to end up with me but I feel bad for you because I will drive you effing crazy you're gonna hate me by the time we're done with this stuff. <laughs> if you are stuck trying to dissuade me, you're gonna, you know, by the end of things, you're gonna come to my side because <laughs> I will love you too. And I'll just like, I will be so endearing to you that you're gonna like me in the end and you're gonna quit your job. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, at least you won't be converting me to, to your side. Let me see, let me just put that like. Um, but yeah, it was just an interesting process. Um, somebody really wanted me to go over that. So, uh, I know, like I said, I haven't really talked about it for a long time. So I did definitely want to kind of dive into it. Um, another thing for me was the day that I saw the filaments in, in my son's comb, uh, was the day that I claimed my sovereignty it was the day I got really mad, but that was also the day that I just knew instinctively this was a choice that this I just knew that there was no universe in the world after struggling to get both him and his brother here so hard that there was no universe that I would have ever and had struggling to get his brother back from severe uh, regressive autism, which I was so lucky enough to do. But I knew there was no universe in the world that I would ever signed on to come into if there was any God or I had any power whatsoever that I would watch my children 
become transhumanistic robots. Like there just was never gonna, it was never gonna go down on my watch. It wasn't gonna be allowed. There was no option for that. None, just none, just not gonna do it. So I kind of looked at it like Resident Evil, like I tell people a lot of times. I thought, well, even if it's chemtrails, let's just say, even if it's something man-made that's not in our best and highest good, nothing has a right to take over my consciousness. Nothing. I'm stronger than that. I won't allow it. I don't give a crap what you want to do. I'm not going to allow that. Um, just because, like, that chick from Resident Evil got injected with a T-virus, she didn't become some horrible, terrible monster. She used it, and she became more. And she helped other people. And so that's what I said that night. I actually said that to God that night. I said, look, you know, I don't know what's going on. I really don't have an effing clue. But I know I wouldn't have chosen this. And I know that you're there. I know that there is a God. I know you exist. I just know it. And it's so deep within me that it's not negotiable. There's just it's unshakable for me. Um, I don't know that I think of God as some guy sitting on a throne like I used to. That's for sure. And my, my concept of God is a little different than it used to be. But that night I said, look, I'd heard about, you know, claiming your sovereignty. So I just did it, you know, and everything changed. Everything changed for me. And so I would just encourage people to, you know, anybody watching my stuff, though, you guys are already there. I mean, you're already so far ahead of that. Um, but somebody definitely wanted me to go back and kind of just touch on that. So we'll definitely put this video into a couple parts. That's my, that's my backup story. That's how I got to hear, uh, what are you going to do? You know, things just get a little crazy sometimes. But I would say that I'm very confident in, as the process continues, as it becomes more and more, I just know. I just know. I don't know how to explain how I know what I know. And I don't have all the information like some other people. Like Luna Ash is amazing. Uh, Magenta Pixie is amazing. Wes uh, Penray, they're amazing. You know, Lisa Transcendence Brown. They seem to have all these answers. Lisa Renee. Um, they have all these beautiful answers. Uh, so much information that I don't really have. But I think in some ways that, you know, I'm not supposed to have that information because part of my journey is sharing this with all of you. And had I had all that information, I would never have come forward. I just wouldn't have. I don't, it just, I came forward in part because I was scared and looking for answers. You know what I mean? And I just don't think that wouldn't have worked out the same way for me. Let me put it that way. Maybe I would have written a book, but it, but it wouldn't have been what it is. Uh, and it seems like a lot of people need to see you know, and a lot of people have grown with me on my journey. You know, a lot of people found me, you know, a while ago. Um, a lot of people are just finding me, but, you know, and so they've grown with me. They've asked those questions that I've, if you guys go back and see some of my earlier vids, like I ask questions, you know, I'm frustrated sometimes. And, and a lot of people have grown with me during this process. And so I think I was not given a lot of the answers on purpose. So I would search for them. So I would share with all of you, you know. I, that's just the way I, I look at that. But I just, as the process continues, I just know. I just know more and more and more, it just seems like. Um, and this process is amazing. I mean, it's really hard in the beginning. Everybody goes through this purging and detoxing phase, and that is so hard. Oh my gosh, it's so hard, you guys. Um, the easiest thing that you can do is just be loving, though, and not stress it. I know it's so hard. God, that's the hardest thing to do, right? Find those moments of love in the simplest of things is my best advice. And I think that, you know, um, a lot of people wonder, like, why does it seem so much more in you sometimes than, than seems to be seen in some other people? And I think there's a few reasons for that. I don't know if one of them has to do with the fact that I'm RH negative. I don't, I don't know, you know. I, I do think there is some sort of something with that, but I don't want to anybody to think that that separates you know I really don't want to get into that separation of anything um, so I don't want anybody to think that you know I have many many arch positive friends that this is they're just as, as sparkly as I am or almost you know what I mean so it's not just I don't want anybody to think that but I, I wonder sometimes if it had anything to do with it um, but I also think the fact that I was always empathic because I think the more empathy you have uh, the greater this you know, more compassion and the more love that you have, the greater this process uh, is, the easier this process is, or the more that this process is. 
I also think because I was really forced uh, when I had to stay home for a number of years when my son got sick, I was really forced to go through what a lot of people are doing right now, which is really figure out where your priorities are. And so for me, a long time ago, I had to learn really, really quickly what mattered and what didn't and to find the joy in the smallest of things, you know, and, and I did, you know, I did. And that's what we're being taught to do now, you know, is you find those you find the love in every moment, even if you're doing dishes, even if you're pissed off, even if somebody's yelling at you, you know what I mean? Like you have to be able to find the joy and the love and the meaning of life in, in every single moment that you're given. And so I always made a promise to myself years and years ago, once I had my kids, that I was never going to go to bed, if possible, ever without being thankful, without finding, yeah, without, without finding the joy in each day. And so I've always tried to stick to that. Now, it's not possible every day, obviously. But most days, I think I've done really well with that. And I always said I was going to go to bed not leaving anything unsaid. You know, obviously, I'm a long-winded talker. But I, I have stuck true to that. And I was always going to be honest. And I've really stuck true to that. Like, I'm honest to a fault. That's a fair statement. My ex-husband will definitely tell you I'm honest. <laughs> He's like, you shouldn't be so honest. <laughs> just say it. But, you know... Um, but I've always just had this thing with animals and with, oops, okay, I had to kind of pause for a second there. But anyways, to wrap it up, uh, for this first video, I will be, uh, putting another video out on the heels of this probably, uh, that goes over some of the other stuff that's going on, but just know that everything, uh, is increasing in intensity. These energies are only accelerating. They're not going to get less, uh, intense. So you've got to find your balance somewhere. I know all of you are managing to do that somehow some way or you wouldn't be watching my crazy stuff that's for sure and i just want to say thank you to everybody finally hit a thousand um and i just i really appreciate every single one of you i love connecting with you guys it's so important that we make these connections it's just so important and i know that um my stuff seems a little crazy but like I said, I'm still, I think, one of the only people showing it. And I think it's so important because this is happening to so many people and, and people need to, you know, it's time we all notice. It's time that we all start really figuring out what's important and what's not, right? And the fact that we can make these connections with each other, that goes so far and it changes everything. So I'm going to leave off on that for right now. So very much loved you all. Um, be kind, compassionate to everybody you meet. Uh, do commit those random acts of kindness anytime, any place that you can, because we are really changing things. I know it doesn't seem like it to some extent, but we are. These giant waves are, we're changing things. I am seeing giant changes in my world. I know you guys have to, starting to be seeing some of those too. And I know some of you are struggling because you might be at the beginning of your process. I promise you, oh, it makes me cry just thinking about that. I just feel that emotion from you guys. I promise you it gets easier. I promise you. Uh, there's, I'm not going to say it's all rainbows and butterflies because it's not. It's not. You have to you have to purify, you know, and that's we're being raised up. It's kind of like relevations, uh, which I'm going to touch on in my other video. It's kind of like what they say. It's a little metaphorical, though, not literal. We are being raised up right now. We're being raised up right now, and it's kind of the death of the ego, and, you know, we're being raised, uh, and we have to purify, and we have to cleanse. It's not an easy process though. So just hang in there, know that you're loved. Uh, just make sure you find a support system. I'm always available, not always available, but you know, you can always reach out to me if you can't find you know, anybody else to reach out to and you feel really lonely or you just you know, wanna talk to somebody. Um, you know, people on my channel are amazing. Everybody that's watching this stuff is already under or in the process, I would say. So, you know, you're always safe to leave comments on my channel. It's always a safe place. And make connections with others. It's so important right now. So very much loved you guys. I'll catch you on the rebound. Be good. Let your light shine. I love your light. What does it say? Oh, I can't even read my own shirt now. Uh, the light in me loves the light in you. So catch you on the rebound. Love.